I don't mean to keep secrets from you, but there are some things I haven't been fully open about. It's time to reveal my favorite secret tricks and effects in After Effects. So let's hop straight into After Effects with tip number one. This one is a secret effect that I use way too often and haven't really spoken about before, and that is Extract. I'm gonna use FX Console to add my effect to my layer. And essentially what it does is you can either extract the highlights or the shadows. And I use this super often to only add glow to the highlights just because I think it looks a little bit more pleasing. I have this little image in here in my composition and I've added the effect and now I can just drag the sides up here to either remove the shadows or the highlights. The way I like to do it is I like to drag it up and then this bottom slider right here, if you drag it out, you can feather it out. So it's a lot more of a smoother transition. What I like to do from there is just add a deep glow. And there you go, you've added glow to only the highlights, which just looks a little bit nicer. Like if you see up here in the corners, you can see it just gives that nice little rim lighting. I feel like it's an effect that doesn't get enough attention. Tip number two is adding markers to your composition. This is super useful in project management and longer projects where you have different scenes, you wanna transition between and animate between one another. The shortcut for it is super simple. So I have this little sequence from last week's video. And if I were to actually make this a, a full project, I would just go to where I want to transition and then hit shift four. And then I know this is a new transition. And then you could always double click on it and you can change it to whatever you want. Let's say transition, to map and you can pick any color you want so you can keep it organized. Let's say you have animated sequences, you have regular footage, you have transitions, little overlay text, super easy way to keep it all organized. And I know some of you have asked about how I actually work in my animation workflow. And this is one little trick that I use very often and just helps me stay organized and get an overview of how far in I am and what I still need to do. Tip number three is grain. I've talked about texture before, but I don't feel like I've touched enough upon this very specific effect, which is add grain. There's a bunch of different ways you can add grain to your layers. In this case, I just have a little composition set up. Let's add an adjustment layer. You have noise, HLS, noise, HLS auto, noise alpha, noise, but my favorite is add grain. Now you can add this and you'll get this little rectangle. So you wanna go into the effect and change it to final output to see it everywhere. And it's just gonna be a very subtle little grain. You can see if we turn it off, it's very minimal. There's nothing crazy. The reason why I love this effect in particular to add grain is because of the presets. They have a whole bunch which all have a little bit of a different characteristic. So you get a little bit of different looks and they have some film ones as well, which just looks super sick. I like Kodak 200T. I just, I, I just, it just vibes with me. I also like uh, Kodak Vision 800T is also very nice, it's a little bit more punchy, but that's not all that goes into the effect because the way I like to do it is I don't really like these co the color in the noise, which is normal. That's how it actually works, but I don't like it. Now they do have a monochromatic option, but it's not true black and white because you can still see there's a little bit of brownish greenish color. So what I like to do is I like to make a new layer. So hit command Y to create a new solid and then change the color to metal gray, 50% gray, 80, 80, 80 for the hex code, set that up. And then you can add green, the effect to that layer and change it to final output, pick the preset you really like. So in this case, Kodak 200T, you can change the intensity, which is just how crazy do you want it to be? The size of the grain. I usually like to go just a little bit higher just because it makes it a little bit softer, more pleasing in my opinion. Change the softness as well if you want it to be a lot softer. The main thing we want to do with this though is add a tint or a tritone or colorama or a hue saturation and just decrease the saturation so that you get a black and white image. So this way we're actually gonna get a true monochromatic and it works really well with blending modes. Pre-comp that layer, name it grain, and then you can change the blending mode. Again, a little bit of, a, of an inside tip, hold shift and then use plus or minus to shift between the blend modes. It's just a little bit easier to work that way rather than picking one, seeing what it looks like. This gives you a preview in real time. With the grain, I typically like overlay, soft light or linear light. They all give a little bit of a different look. Linear light is the punchiest one of them all. So if you're going for a more aggressive look, definitely go with that. I use it often because I do like a lot of noise and grain in my, in my animations. If you have a transparent background, you just want to make sure that you have track mat selected and they're just going to make sure that it's only visible on the layers that you actually want to see. Now tip number four has saved me a whole bunch of time and I didn't start using this shortcut because I didn't know it until recently where I started to work with a lot of different size compositions and footage. 
I'd have maybe a 4K composition with 1080p footage. And instead of having to scale it up or scale it down using the scale, I would then go into my layer, right click, transform. And there, so we actually have some shortcuts. So the one I use the most, just cause it's second nature to me at this point is fit comp to width, shift option, command and H will scale it right down. And that's usually what I like to go by. It just makes it a lot easier. Otherwise you can use G instead of H for the height instead of width. Saved me a lot of clicks, saved me a lot of time. My fingers are happy. Tip number five is a bit new and I mentioned it in the last video as well cause it is so sexy and I can't believe I've slept on it for so long, but it is warp chroma. Now there is a way to do this manually in a way. So if you watch my VHS video, you'll see exactly how to do that. But warp chroma is just so much faster. And when you're on deadlines, you're working on projects, you want to be efficient and this is definitely one way. So adding an adjustment layer, I'm just going to add the warp chroma effect using FX console. Adding that up, we already have this super sick look and we can of course adjust it. We can add a little bit of spin to it if we want to and we can adjust the strength by moving these, uh, the red and the green line closer and further away from one another. So I like to just a little bit on the edges, which just gives it a little bit more of that texture, especially on something that's supposed to look like a computer screen or more stylized, this looks super cool because you get some of that nice RGB split. And there's so many settings you can play with and you can mess with the colors of it. So really have fun and play around with it, make some cool things. As always, I feel a link in the description if you are interested. If not, the VHS video will show you how to do something very similar for free natively in After Effects. The sixth tip is the power of Photoshop files. This is something I've been using pretty much ever since I started working in After Effects and it's just been so efficient for my workflow being able to use Photoshop files because they let you change things in Photoshop and update in real time in After Effects. For the longest time, I found it so much easier just aligning everything and getting the spacing right in Photoshop and then animating it in After Effects. So this is one way to let me get the best of both worlds. So if I take a PSD file here and I drag it in and I'm just gonna import kind composition and merge layer styles into footage. And then you can hit okay. Now we have this nice little artboard. If I click in and then remove that background, you can see we have a couple of different layers and we also have a text layer. But I noticed, hmm, I can see my text is spelled wrong. What I would normally do is go into Photoshop and then I can go in and let's say I wanna change this to nice and actually spell it right and maybe even move it up here and then change the font to something a little bit cooler. We can do that, increase the kerning a little bit and center it up. And then I'm just gonna save it and then going straight back into After Effects, you can see it's updated in real time. So it just makes it a lot more efficient if you're working with a lot of layers, or in my case, I really like the collage style. So I have a lot of photo elements. So it just makes it a little bit easier if I have to lay out and maneuver those things. Another thing about this is if you have a text layer like this layer right here, and you wanna add some text animators to it, you can do that in After Effects. Simply right click on the layer and then go to create and convert to editable text. That's gonna keep the text exactly where it is. You can change it, it's fully editable text. It's just a regular text layer at this point. Tip number seven is grids. This is super useful if you wanna line stuff up or if you have some text animations where you want it to keep it centered. This is a super neat way of doing it and it's basically how I line everything up in After Effects. So I have this little text set up here and it's not the straightest I've ever seen. So I would typically use my grid, so Alt or Option and then apostrophe and that'll bring up my nice little grid. And then I can start using these to line up. But sometimes I need just an extra level of specificity or precision. So I can remove that hitting the same shortcut, which is option and apostrophe, and then instead hitting command and apostrophe. And that's just gonna give me a tighter grid with more little extra grids inside and just make it a little bit easier to get the spacing right. And then I can start one by one, I'll line it up using typically my arrow keys, just lining everything up and we can get the spacing perfectly. Our top row already looks way better because we aligned it using the grid. Now this eighth one is a little bit of a secret effect hack spice sauce looking thing. I use this all the time just because I like it. It flows well. It's a nice little detail element and you can do a couple of different things with it. Sometimes I'll use it as a background element and make it a lot thicker. Sometimes I'll use it just as a little detail going across the screen. It's all powered by the stroke. So I've just got a simple stroke set up here. I just took my pen tool. You can even delete that. Hit G to bring up your pen tool. Make sure fill is removed and add a stroke color. And you can set the width to whatever you want, just depending on the look you're going for. And then I just click and drag and click and drag until I get a nice little shape that looks pretty smooth and organic. You can always go in and change it. But then we're gonna add a trim pulse to it first and foremost. So go into add, trim pulse, 
and we are gonna set a keyframe for zero with the end. And then we're gonna go forward to just whatever, keyframe that to 100, then go a couple frames backwards and keyframe the start, go forward again and set the start to 100. So now we have it coming through and animates out. If we go into the shape and then go into stroke and wave, we can get it to look pretty sick. So if we add a little bit of wave, so just increase the amount, you can see it kind of looks like this, well, a wavy stroke. Increase the wavelength, so it looks a little bit more natural and not as intense. That looks pretty good. And we can even add some taper too, if you like that. So taper at the beginning, so it just kind of eases into that shape. In this instance, we're just gonna do the wave. I don't typically combine the wave and the taper, it's usually one or the other. Additionally, we'll animate the phase of the wave. So just keyframe the phase, go to the end of your animation and just set that to one rotation. And that'll just mean that as we animate, it just goes along, just looks pretty sick, just adds a little bit of extra movement. And you might wanna do it the opposite way, it just depends on which way your line is animating. Just make sure they go the same way that typically looks the coolest. That's only the beginning of it though, because we have a little bit more source to add to it. One thing I love to do is changing the blend mode to dissolve. And that's just gonna give us a tiny little bit of texture in there. And then if we add a fast box blur, we can increase that. And that's just gonna make it look a little bit cooler. And then I typically duplicate the layer and then remove the fast box blur. And that's just gonna give us a little bit of almost like noise feathering in there. I just think it looks super cool when you can play around with the parameters and get something you think looks pretty sick. You can even go ahead, add an extra one, decrease the stroke width and change the color to a lighter color. Just make it like a nice core center and then add something like a deep glow to it. And that's just gonna give us a nice little core that makes it look like a glowing, almost lightsabery. The ninth one is super underrated. I'm not very good at math on the spot, I'm not gonna lie. So thankfully Adobe has me covered. This works in Illustrator, in Photoshop, everything. And that is simply doing math in your parameters. So let's say I have a layer here and I wanna move it 10 pixels to the right. So instead of going 10 times on my arrow keys, I can simply go into my position in whichever direction I want it to move, I can add 10, I can subtract 10, I can even times it by 10 if I want to. Super easy way of doing animations and if you wanna position stuff according to one another, let's say they were both centered and we wanna move them each 10 pixels away from the center, so we can just go ahead and end the position. Instead of sliding and guessing and moving up and down, we'll simply go in and do a plus 10. And then for the other one, we'll of course wanna move it the other way, so minus 10. And just like that, we have a shape that now intersects exactly 10 pixels each way. That works in your composition settings as well. If you wanna create a comp that's double the size, you can simply go into one and duplicate it by, let's say two, and now we have a 10K composition. It's that simple. Now this last effect is a secret stroke brush hack, I suppose. I watched this in a tutorial a long time ago and recently it was brought to my attention again and I just figured I might as well share it because I use it from time to time. It's a really nice way of getting a nicer looking brush stroke if you don't have any assets. What you want to do is select your shape tool and remove the stroke and then create a circle. We'll just make a white. Click and hold shift while you're dragging out and you can always move this circle around by holding space. You can move it while you're creating it and go back to scaling it but we're just gonna leave it right there and make sure it's a perfect circle. And we're gonna center it up and we are gonna make a new composition and just name this brush. Go into that composition and we're gonna hit Command K to bring up my composition settings. And we'll just change this to maybe something, let's do a 500 by 500. And then we can just take our layer and use the shortcut that we just learned earlier, Shift, Command, Option, H, and that'll scale it down to fit our thing. And now we can add a fractal noise to that. And you can change the look of the fractal noise to get whatever look you kind of want, but you want to go back into your main composition and then we are going to hit G or just select your pen tool up here and make sure that your layer isn't selected. And now we can start drawing out the path that we want our brush to follow. So let's say we want to do a little whimsical path here. And then we can open up our path that we just made, go into shape, path, copy that, hit P on your brush, and then paste it. Just Command V, delete that, and now we have it going across. And we can always scale this down. Let's hit S to bring up the scale, scale that down, and hit U. And now we have this nice little animation that'll follow along. You can always right click, transform, and auto-orient, 
and then orient along path. And that'll just mean that as it goes along the starting position and then it turns, it'll follow along that path. And now we can actually get to creating the brush. We wanna add an adjustment layer and we wanna add echo to it. And that is the base or the driver of our brush. We wanna change the echo operator to minimum. And then we wanna change the number of echoes. As you can see, we're starting to draw out our little path. So far we have a lot of spacing, but it goes a pretty far away. It actually looks like a brush. So we wanna change the echo time and we wanna set it to something like 0 0.003 and that'll give us a really tight brush. From there, you wanna adjust the echo numbers. You wanna play around with this. This can be pretty intense because we'll make a lot of duplicates. So you might wanna play with the time maybe set it to something like five instead of three and that gives us a nice little brush. My favorite for this one is minimum or maximum depending on the look that you're going for. Minimum works pretty well. And then you can add a motion blur to your brush and that's just gonna smooth it out a little bit. That is pretty much how you make a nice little animated brush. If you want to taper it, let's hit S. Shift S to bring up the scale alongside the position. Keyframe the scale at whatever size you want it, and then set it to maybe something like two, and go forward and keyframe again, and scale it out to something like zero. And then you can select your keyframes and right click on them. Keyframe assistant, easy ease. And just like that, we have a nice little brush that is animated with some tapering. And that is pretty much it for the 10 secret tips, tricks, effects video type thing. We've covered a lot of effects and a lot of very specific niche things. And sometimes it's important to have that fundamental knowledge and just little things that'll make your workflow easier. And these are 10 things that help me in my daily workflow. That's pretty much it. I just want to say thank you. Hopefully you learned something new. If you have any sick tips that I didn't cover, please leave them in the comments. I'd love to know and make my workflow more efficient. And uh, yeah, thank you. I'll see you again next week. Peace out.